groundbreaking developments at Egghead as another Nika-like figure enters the scene. And here at Joy News, we were able to secure an interview with the Joy Girl herself. Joy Girl, after years of loving, admiring, and obsessing over the series, how does it feel to be finally canon? Anything is possible! Don't let your dreams be dreams, man! If you can dream it, you can be it! The Gorosei, I'm coming for you. You're about to be the Norosei. I'd like to thank my dad. Kuma, 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 pameleon. And it's been a while since we've just done a straight up pure chapter discussion. But I believe that chapter 1118, that's a chapter to discuss. Not just because of that final Joy Girl Nika Bonnie moment. Although, believe me, there is a lot to discuss there. There are so many other things that happened in this latest chapter that we have to discuss. So why don't we just jump straight into it because my brain is chock-a-block full of all of these wild ramblings. This chapter left me with a bunch of questions as always, so here goes. And the first question I have is surrounding the Iron Giant. Primarily, I want to know how it's still alive, how it's still powered, how it's still active and conscious and thinking. And I don't mean just because it's been attacked by the Gorosei. It's been established that the Iron Giant was created by the ancient kingdom so its powers its abilities its capabilities its durability are all matters that have yet to be revealed blah 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 it's strong it could withstand the attacks i get all that but in previous chapters it seemed like the iron giant only awoke with nika's presence when it sensed joy boy's presence it actually looked like it was being powered by luffy's gear fifth nika form like the drums of liberation was what was powering the iron giant so then given that luffy has not been in that Nika Gear 5th form for quite some time now, how has the Iron Giant managed to stay awake, stay activated for so long? On one hand, maybe it received enough juice just to keep going, but also it made me start wondering whether the idea that Nika's presence or Joy Boy's presence is required to physically power up the Iron Giant has actually been a misdirect all along. As in that the Iron Giant can be conscious, can be awake, or has even been conscious all along, but only really actively wakes up when it chooses to. And it's just simply been conserving its energy, waiting for Joy Boy to return, but not that it necessarily needs Joy Boy to return. And I want to take this back to the events at Marijuana 200 years ago. We know that that was seemingly the last time it was powered up, and even then, Vegapunk said that it ran out of juice. And so that led us all onto speculation trends wondering was there another Nika-like Joy Boy-like figure, a would-be could-be Joy Boy that ultimately failed but not before briefly waking up the Iron Giant. But what if that wasn't what happened at all? What if the Iron Giant woke itself up or powered up on its own volition simply because it felt that it was time to, because it was a good opportunity to, because events were happening, developments were happening around the world, a moment that was needed to be fulfilled, the development on the Fishman front. We obviously know that there is a lot of history, a lot of promise between Joy Boy and the Fishman. Unfulfilled promises, Joy Boy's wishes, his desires and intentions. And so if there was some development happening on that front, the abolition of slavery, the first reverie that the Fishman were going to attend, these all seem like the burgeoning of the fulfillment of Joy Boy's promise. And so what if the Iron Giant saw this as a good opportunity to go up, contribute, help fulfill feel Joy Boy's wishes, seize the opportunity, and then once it found out that, hang on, this actually isn't that opportunity, decided to, never mind, abandon the cause. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that the Iron Giant doesn't need Joy Boy's presence or doesn't need the Sun God Nika to wake up, but it has been waiting for the Sun God Nika, and it has been waiting for Joy Boy's return. And so even all of those moments we witnessed earlier in the Egghead arc, when it seems like the Iron Giant is waiting 
waking up and then sort of powers back down. Oh, up again, back down again. Those are all moments where it's feeling out. Hang on a second, I can feel Joy Boy's presence. Nika is here. And then when he doesn't feel that presence anymore, it just chooses to power down and conserve its energy. And because of the prolonged gear fifth state that Luffy maintained, that was when the Iron Giant sort of clicked onto the fact that, hang on, this might really be Joy Boy's return. And I get that Vegapunk did explain that the Iron Giant ran out of energy. What if that was just also a misunderstanding? I mean, he also did say that the whole event was beyond the comprehension of the scientists of that period. And so maybe to them it seemed like the Iron Giant ran out of energy, whereas in reality, the Iron Giant just decided to power down. I don't know, I just feel like maybe there was a misdirect there. Maybe it will be significant, maybe not, but the speculating part of me just couldn't help but wonder what some of this dialogue really meant. I guess the other piece of lore and mystery that continues was Vegapunk's message. To the frustration of many fans, after Vegapunk's message was cut short in chapter 1117, we come back what seems to be, I guess, now the beginning of a new mystery. I'm guessing the name of the ancient kingdom, but more likely the name of the special D member, the D clan, somebody's name. The continuation of that sentence, among you there is, I don't know, a savior. Someone who is going to bring about the new dawn. And their name was, surprise surprise Luffy. But then again, maybe it was, surprise surprise Bunny. And this is really interesting to me because in the Viz translation, the word, the character, or the sound that Vegapunk's message ended on in chapter 1117 was simply a uh, whereas I know that wasn't the case for the unofficial translations. That was mo, and mo could have lots of different meanings, whether it's the beginning of a word, whether it's just a particle, it really depends on the context. Look, at this point, I'm not sure that we are going to see Vegapunk's message continue, and I think the amount of information that we got, I'm actually very, very satisfied with. I didn't really discuss this after the last chapter. I'm not surprised at all that we were blue balled. I think we got a heck of a lot of reveals already from this arc, even from Vegapunk's last messages, his last transmission to the world. I don't think we were ever really gonna find out the full truth of the ancient kingdom or the D clan, and I don't think it's quite time to yet. It does, however, have me wondering about what the role, the future role of Lilith, York, and Atlas will be. I mean, via punk records, they surely all all have some sort of understanding of what really transpired during the Void Century, what that final message of Vegapunk's was going to be. Are they going to be the ones to drip feed it to us through the rest of the series? I guess that's why we do have that segment in this chapter where the Gorosei say that the rest of the satellites have to be exterminated and that they provide no use anymore. It's really not just that they don't provide any use, they're a hindrance to the world government because they know everything and they're not on the world government's side. Although that segment also had me wondering whether this is pointing to whether we're gonna get a new addition to the Straw Hats after this arc, even if it's just a temporary companion. Like if the Gorosei managed to kill at least one of them, will the other one survive? Just to continue Vegapunk's will. And if that is the case, then I would have to think it's Lilith. Just because she seems to fit in with the Straw Hats in terms of personality. Also, she was the first of the Vegapunks that we were introduced to. Who knows, maybe it's even York. Ken? York be redeemed at this point? I don't know, what do you guys think? Are you willing to forgive York if she decides to help the Straw Hats instead? Do you see it as a possibility that she would? At this point, I don't really think so. I was even wondering what purpose or how much use she would serve for the world government if they do actually manage to exterminate the other two satellites. I mean, I understand the world government's plan is to continue harvesting the benefits of punk records via York, but I wonder whether punk records will actually continue continue to grow. I understand that they can extract the knowledge that's already been accumulated, but just how much capacity does York have for research, for thinking, critical thinking? Like, is she really going to be an important figure for the rest of the series? Are we really going to have to watch our backs for the world government just being continuously able to develop new weapons? I guess we sort of have to now, right? Just to raise the stakes? We are in the final saga. Like, that is just so wild and crazy and scary for me because they already have the mother flame. Can you imagine if they just continue to develop more and more weapons and without that sort of middle person of Vegapunk somehow 
somehow just slightly able to manipulate them, acting covertly so that they don't get their hands on the full suite of crazy, dangerous technology that he could have really developed if he wanted to. I mean, this is just a recipe for more chaos and disaster because I'm sure that, I don't know, they would be more than happy to go and commission Caesar Clown to continue his research. And can you just imagine the type of messed up weapons we're going to now see if that's the case? I don't know, it'd be really even crazy if we see like Germa, Vince Merck Judge, decides that it's a very lucrative proposal and he decides to sort of team up with the world government. The world government agrees to turn a blind eye to all of their underworld dealings in exchange for their technology and, and their developmental capacities. Okay, I'm rambling again, so let's get back on track. I guess I skipped over all of the reaction piece that happened in this chapter. I forgot, or rather, I assumed that the citizens of Arabasta would know the truth about Luffy's involvement at Arabasta. I understand that it was an event that was covered up in the eyes of the rest of the world. I know that saving Arabasta was attributed to Smoker, but I don't know why I just assumed that the citizens of Arabasta would know the truth. I guess it was because there are obviously some citizens within Arabasta that do know the truth. Um, Koza, for example, and Toto, who are shown in that panel. So I just would have assumed that the word would spread throughout Arabasta, but I guess it hasn't because some are still very willing to believe that Straw Hats are the bad guys and Luffy has indeed kidnapped and now killed Vegapunk. Also funny to see that Leo is just as gullible as ever. Again, I don't know why I thought that his belief in the Straw Hats, he would at least believe in Luffy. I mean, he's even wearing the Straw Hat Grand Fleet hat, for goodness sakes. But yes, I get it. Gullibility, that is their defining character trait. Nice callback, that's on me. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the giant segment of this chapter because this also contains some pretty big head scratches. But first, before we get into all of the mysteries, I do have to say I loved all of the interactions that we saw in these couple of pages. The giants and Luffy jumping on, the banter between the captains, the conversation going on between Sanji, Nami, and Usopp. It was just all so nostalgic, all so hilarious. Really takes me back to simpler times. And then obviously, slotted alongside that is just like awesome panels of Bonnie being totally badass, having used her powers against Dole and Bluegrass who look totally cute. And then even some sneaky little panels that make me think about possible future interactions or clashes. The big one being Mars en route for the giant ship makes me wonder, I don't know, is there going to be an aerial battle between Mars and his crazy bird form versus Sanji? I mean, Zoro did get a very brief clash with Venus Juro very recently, so I feel like it's Sanji's turn. It even seems like that fight between Zoro and Nazjuro might continue because I'm pretty sure that's Nazjuro in the background behind Nami there. He is still on his way. Oh, and then we also got some new names of some of the giants, Bjorn and Sig. I'm pretty sure those are new names, right? We haven't been introduced to them formally before. It seems like they're both based off some pretty legendary, pretty significant Norse gods or Norse mythology, Bjorn being a warrior king, and Sig possibly related to Sif, or being short of Sigin? Sigin? Sig or Sigin? Sig, Sigin? Sigin? I don't know how to pronounce that. But a deity, again from Norse mythology, best well known for being the wife of Loki, or being one of his wives at least. A very dutiful wife who helped her husband whilst he was captured. Very interesting detail, however, is the cap. The helmet, I should say. The helmet that the giant is wearing. Because that seems awfully similar to the helmet that we've seen in the cover story with Anel and the moon people. I mean, come on, like, give me your theories, people, because that is surely a clue. Some sort of hint. We're definitely gonna find out the connection between Elbafians, the giant race, and the moon people. It's all connected. And... I guess this is a really great time to discuss probably 
exactly what was the second biggest mystery, biggest lore reveal of the chapter. The Albafians can hear Luffy's drums of liberation. I mean, what? Dun 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 dun. Look at them dancing during the middle of an escape of a massive, a high stakes. We gotta get out of here emergency situation. Look, someone else is gonna have to do the research and fact check me on this, but if I am not mistaken, I do believe that aside from the Iron Giant and Zunesha, and I guess the Gorosei, Dory and Brogi might be the only other people or the other beings that we've seen react to be able to hear Luffy's drum beats. Why? What does that mean? What is the connection between giants and all these mythical lore, you all? I mean, look, there's a theory brewing somewhere. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but you'll tell me what you're thinking after this chapter. I thought it was also fantastic to see that Luffy's even able to control water. Look at the bouncy jumping castle water waves that is happening. That just really widens the tremendous potential of Luffy's power. He's able to control the water. I mean, that's huge. And now it's double huge because it's not not just Luffy, potentially, likely, maybe. Okay, I guess we're discussing it. There are two of them now. That is redonkulous. I don't even know where to begin with this one, honestly. When I was reading this chapter for the first time, I was just so, so taken aback, so shocked. But then in retrospect, it also makes so much sense. And I feel like, I guess it was foreshadowed. I guess it's something that we could have really expected. I just don't really quite understand the mechanics of it all. And I guess that's the point because it hasn't been explained to us yet, but it seems like Bonnie has actually achieved Nika status, or not status, but at least the Nika form. She is totally free. She's not just imitating. She has the full rings and everything. So it's not like she's just copied the appearance. To some extent, she has the capacities. She has those capabilities. That's probably why we got that panel, that segment of the Iron Giant. He's recognizing Joy Boy slash Joy Girl's presence, both of their presences. Although I guess he doesn't really specify that he's hearing too, but I think we could take that as implied. Like, what does that mean? How? Is it through Luffy? Is it just her devil fruit? I don't know. It just... My brain. I thought by now I would have made a little bit more sense of this. It seems like I haven't. But okay, I'm going to do this with you all. Let's think about this calmly and logically. In a lot of ways, we are seeing for real the manifestation of what Vegapunk theorized and speculated about the nature of Devil Fruits. Much earlier in this arc, we did see Vegapunk say something along the lines of Devil Fruits are just the manifestations of people people's dreams or people's wishes, people's desires. I think desires was actually the word that he used. Now I am just paraphrasing here, but it was humans' desires for what they wished alternate futures alternate realities could be. And that is the perfect explanation of Bonnie's devil fruit. She has that ability to manifest alternate realities, alternate futures. Does that mean she just somehow has another devil fruit that is just as OP as Luffy's is because both of theirs heavily center around the idea of imagination and potential? Or does she simply have a devil fruit that allows her to copy anyone's devil fruit abilities? And if so, what are those limitations? Or does that mean everyone's devil fruit to some extent could awaken at least to some level that sort of capability? Or is it because of the strength of Luffy's will and his imagination that he has somehow manifested it for her? But if we move away from the logical, the physical, the scientific explanations for how this is happening, just on a symbolic and I guess more poignant meaning, 
meaningful level, I think this is just beautiful. It just encapsulates Luffy and his desires and his purpose so well. Luffy really is the beacon of freedom. He is the, <laughs> the warrior of liberation. And as we know time and time again, his liberation, his story of freedom is not just individual, his personal, his own freedom. It's liberation and freedom for everyone. And so for him to witness and help Bonnie achieve that same fate, achieve that same power, I mean, that is just fantastic. Not to mention Kuma's part in all of this. I can't believe that this is the way we are getting that much anticipated, much speculated, much awaited moment where Kuma recognizes and witnesses Joy Boy for himself. Ever since we witnessed Kuma's flashback, his backstory, the fact that he knows of, admires, and has been wanting to witness Joy Boy for himself his whole life, we've all known that at some point in the story, at some point in this Egghead Island arc, we were going to see a panel where Kuma is able to satisfy himself being in the presence of Joy Boy. That was pretty much guaranteed, and we got it, but we got it in ways that we just never, never would have expected. Or at least I never expected. I truly did not think that the way we were going to see that glorious moment was going to be even more glorious, even more meaningful, because Kuma gets to witness it via his daughter, via Bonnie, his entire life. And I like, I'm gonna cry. I'm tearing up just thinking and talking about this. But it's just such a beautiful way in which it was depicted. The fact that we get to see this small panel of Kuma in the present to show us that that's his inner monologue. It's him thinking back to that moment at Ginny's deathbed where he promised Ginny that he would raise Bonnie well and that Ginny could rest now, didn't have to worry because he was gonna make sure Bonnie was gonna be all right. And now these are words that he's saying to himself. He knows that he can rest well now because Bonnie is going to be okay. What more assurance does he need about Bonnie's future than knowing that she is Joy Girl? She is, for reasons not yet clear to us, also the promised one. For whatever reason, for however reason, she's going to be alright. And Kuma can finally rest and he can go be with Ginny. And I love that that's also his final thoughts that yes it's tied up with Bonnie but it's also tied up with Ginny. He's looking forward to seeing his best friend his love again and oh <sighs> We should have started a tally on how many times Oda was going to make me cry over Kuma this arc. Because, oh, look, there is so much more that I can discuss and unpack. And I think it is actually a very important moment within One Piece. So I think I actually will discuss it in more depth at some other time. Maybe another time when I'm not so emotional. Because I have heard that this was quite a controversial, quite a heated chapter. And not everyone liked this panel. I mean, I obviously did. But I think it's something worth looking at a little bit closer. So I don't know, let me know what you think. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Why? Why not? What does it mean for you? What sort of concerns do you have? Look, as for now, I am gonna wipe my tears. I am probably gonna read this chapter yet another time. And I guess I will see you guys all very, very soon. I did not expect at all to be getting this sappy. I mean, we started out with the complete and utter joy of Joy Girl entering the series. I don't know how we got there, but hey, that's one piece for you. Anyways, to everyone in the Joy Fleet who have been with me to this day so that we can witness Joy girl entering the series i mean what a groundbreaking moment thank you all again i don't say it enough i appreciate you guys so so much if you are new to the joy fleet then welcome it is not too late to become a follower of the savior joy girl so please do subscribe like comment share the video show all your love of course a huge thank you also to our channel members and our patrons you can also become a patron or a channel member to help support the channel further but i am so i'm gonna stop my ramblings here today this has been great this has been joy girl and i will see you again soon